Liz is a pioneer in active case finding, and, and I think most of you are familiar with her work in Malawi and Zimbabwe. HIV and TB is her passion and, and really informing strategies to strengthen primary health care diagnosis. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, and, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, the um, um, uh, find and the organizers for the opportunity um, to speak. Um, so, um, yeah, active case finding. So um, I almost queried, do we mean active case finding or systematic screening? But I thought, no. Let's, um, we'll, we'll go, we'll stick with the old-fashioned term. Um, so, um, a, a, and as Katarina says, my, my real interest is, is in um, diagnostic intervention strategies, so aiming to improve health outcomes, um, both in um, HIV and in TB. Um, uh, very different diseases, and um, um, the work in TB, of course, was still struggling with um, a diagnostic. So um, I had down, um, I think, my first time ever to, to say, until we have a new point of care diagnostic, we're stuck with X, was probably 2002, uh, and we still don't have it. Um, so, so, so I'm going to use the terms systematic screening and active case finding interchangeably. They do mean different things, um, uh, and I'll come back to that. But, but really, that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about high throughput screening. So why even consider it? Um, and the issue is really um, uh, the ongoing problems with TB diagnosis that we see at every um, level of the health system. Um, so, um, in terms of um, prevalence surveys, um, and I'm going to be frank that I'm coming from a bias, a Southern African bias, um, so my interest really is in adults um, and, and uh, in um, adults living in high HIV settings. Um, the, the prevalence surveys show about 1% of all adults in, in African, Southern African cities are culture positive, and the same is true in some um, Asian um, um, cities. Now, that's a lot. That means every time you go to church, there'll be people, you know, singing infectious particles into the air along with you. But it's sort of not high enough to be an easy task, even with a good diagnostic. And when you then got bad diagnostics, it, it becomes a real problem. Um, so, so just showing here, so this is an, a meta-analysis we've just done about people reporting TB symptoms in um, settings where there's enough HIV for people to screen for both TB symptoms um, undiagnosed TB and to test systematically for, for HIV. And that's, um, so this is a meta-analysis of, of 260,000 participants, uh, and this is the undiagnosed TB prevalence. Um, so again, you're going from 1% with a symptom screen, you're going from 1% roughly up to about 7%, which is kind of a more doable prospect. Um, um, but, but you're getting way higher, a big jump up at primary care, and that's kind of what we know for TB. Um, for HIV, you don't really see that. You, you see high rates, even 20%, in the community. Um, uh, and, um, and, and the other interesting thing... Well, sorry, so let me just go through that. Uh, uh, and, and the other sort of two interesting points are... Um, uh, sorry, one interesting point, is um, um, the really high risk of death. So if you're looking at uh, risk of death, that jumps up at the hospital level, um, and um, um, it's, it's 20, you know, it's 23% for people who are admitted to hospital with a TB symptom um, in, in, um, uh, in these surveys, you know, and that's at two months. So, so you know, absolutely massive, and it, this is with ART, et cetera. So I have to be careful on my timing, very careful on my timing. Um, but what we know is, is that routine diagnosis, uh, uh, and again, I think this is something we really have to bear in mind, is far from efficient or same day, even at the primary care level. So again, these are data just from, um, uh, just from, from this year in Blantyre. Um, 2,346 primary care patients screened at entry. Do they have a cough? Screened at entry, exit, what happened? So um, this is a clinic with expert um, and smear microscopy um, on site. Uh, and we've got same-day treatment in 0.2%. So, you know, this is the reality. Um, and um, uh, Maddie Pai's group has, has just produced um, these data from India. You know, this, this is the same everywhere. And basically, um, you know, it's this requirement for sputum. It just causes all sorts of problems with the throughput of patients. And you really can't screen on, on sputum. I think that's just... The, you know, the basic lesson. If you can't do the primary care level diagnostic management, you're not going to be able to ramp that up to scale. 
Um, and we do have these lessons from the 1980s. So again, this is, if you like, active case funding in a community. Don't try and jump ahead of the facility. So you have to bring the facility along with you. You have to do the health system strengthening at the same time um, before you can leap into the community where, where all that undiagnosed TB is. So it's um, a really important lesson. So whatever we're saying for community just has to be at, at, the, at the primary clinic level as well. So most people, when we're thinking about active case funding, we're kind of thinking out at this sort of level. This is um, Katerina's um, slide, I think, puts it beautifully. So we've got passive case funding and then increasing kind of intensity as you go out deeper into the community. You know, your costs are going to be up, the number of screens are going to be going up, the um, undiagnosed TB is going down. Um, um, but nonetheless, you know, we, we do think we have to do this. Um, uh, and um, uh, in 2013, we had the policy review based on, really on, well, sort of triggered by the a trial um, that I was responsible for in Zimbabwe, where we showed undiagnosed culture positive TB reduced by 40% in two and a half years by a very simple um, strategy um, uh, um, based on, on brief inquiry for chronic cough or opportunity to submit sputum in the, in the community um, and um, uh, health promotion at the same time. And so we saw rapid change um, on a, on a low-cost intervention. Uh, and um, this triggered the, this review. OK, so these three groups are, are strongly recommended because there's a lot of evidence around them. Um, the, these other groups, even prisoners, you know, there's actually very little evidence that screening does you any good. And there's quite a bit of evidence because the diagnostics aren't great, but screening can do harm. So you can easily get to a stage where false diagnosis outweighs um, true diagnosis very easily. Um, uh, so, um, so this was the conclusion um, from, from, from one of the systematic reviews, because that's Katerina's. Um, so individual and community benefits remain uncertain, and um, the benefits of earlier diagnosis have not been established. And that's, if you like, why we had such a cautious recommendation here. You know, it's very expensive to do these. If you don't do them well, um, you can waste a lot of money. And, and we do know some of the evidence was not just absence of evidence, but there was some evidence of absence. In other words, you can do a big study, you know, do a big intensive um, um, effort and have very little yield in terms of the underlying um, um, TB epidemiology. So I think you know that that's a point we have to move past, and I, just, I bring it up because I don't at the moment I don't see any sign that we're investing to move past that point. We need some more data to move past it. So what's new since then? Well, I'm happy to say a lot's new. Um, I do you know I'm, I'm kind of slightly surprised actually having agreed to do this, uh, reviewed all the topics. I mean, there's really a lot that's been out there. And I would just highlight as well um, um, TB Reach, so um, run by the Stop TB Partnership, um, around innovative um, diagnostic delivery. So that's very much the active case finding field. Um, but we also have some, um, some randomized trials, which we were lacking before. So we've had um, four trials showing that TB, save it, TB screening in people living with HIV saves lives. So that's new. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, very consistent. You don't have to do an awful lot. Certainly the LAM, which is the one that I've worked with and Kid and Deed has worked with um, uh, uh, for hospitalized inpatients, very promising. But we also saw reductions from introducing expert compared to fluorescent microscopy in rural Cholo um, and from just kind of tightening up um, uh, um, TB screening in ART clinics where there was no difference there between microscopy or expert. So it didn't matter what you used, but just do more of it. Um, and we've had a number of trials comparing intensified screening, showing that the outcomes for people living with HIV are as good as presumptive TB treatment. So again, I think that's important. Um, um, so, so we're kind of getting, uh, you know, I think for HIV, I'm excited by that. And particularly, you know, there's HIV um, money, and that should excite the HIV people. Um, in terms of the kind of passive um, TB suspect coming, sorry, presumptive TB patient coming to, to the clinic, um, uh, but again, there have been six randomized trials. There, I'd say the results have been less sort of exciting because health outcomes were not hugely improved. Um, what you did find is more complete and rapid um, MDR diagnosis, and that's what expert was developed for. It was not developed as a primary 
um, diagnostic tool um, um, uh, for low um, uh, rifampicin resistant settings. Um, so, um, but that's you know that's good. That's a clear big benefit. Um, there's also evidence for more rapid um, um, treatment um, initiation for drug sensitive TB, but by that you know we're talking about days. You know, so so whether or not it's it's important for the patient themselves. I hope this is. I'm seeing Karen looking at me, looking at me astutely, um, uh, and uh, and maybe some more accurate. So, and the problem is, there's just a lot of um, clinician-initiated um, treatment going on, um, but probably more accurate. So, the treatment that is given is given better to to patients with culture-positive TB rather than negative TB, um, but but little effect on overall case detection and other important outcomes. Um, and then this this um, uh, Big question, you know, are we affecting underlying um, TB epidemiology? There's a couple of presentations, this um, um, conference actually on this, but um, um, nothing, you know, again, very little investment in that. So that's the main problem with that. They just, the trials just haven't been done. Um, so, so where are my sort of um, priorities? You know, I, I think you do have to stratify by the level of the healthcare. Um, but we have to bring them all along. Uh, and unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, before, but, you know, we, we sort of have to start from the bottom up. Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, we've, re um, so doing that, hospital, you know, we're clearly, you know, managing things really badly um, with those extremely high mortalities. Um, a lot of that is TB death. Um, uh, we do need efficient same day diagnosis and, and mortality reduction strategies. Um, and a, and, and a bunch of that is going to be um, more screening, better screening for, for patients admitted to hospital and including HIV testing. Um, um, for the primary care level, I think the, you know, the critical issue is, is the TB active case finding. HIV has come along massively. Um, so a few of the older studies will suggest it's a problem, but I don't think it is now. We're not finding undiagnosed HIV easily at all in, in Malawi now, simply due to scale up of, of HIV testing and care. Um, so uh, um, here, you know, I think this is a question that's going to come up again and again. But again, I think you know, we've, it's kind of hard to treat people who don't have symptoms. Let me tell you that they don't like being told they have TB, and they're probably right in many occasions. Um, so, so just in terms of, of management, it's a lot easier to focus on people with symptoms. And um, um, cough is, um, uh, I think, people are struggling with the four the four symptom screen just because everyone has a symptom, you know, it means everyone basically. Um, cough is, um, um, is recommended internationally for um, infection control purposes, um, so, so that is what I focus on at primary care level. Um, again, everyone's got one of the symptoms here, don't, so, so we don't symptom screen here. At this level, I would focus on, co I focus on cough, um, and, um, and I think it's the TB diagnostic um, is, is the real issue. Um, and then in communities, you know, I'll come on to it, but basically you have to know your epidemic. Um, so um, uh, you have to be focusing on high TB prevalence areas and you need to come up with an affordable but effective strategy. That's a really tough call. Um, uh, and I think what we're looking for there really is, is the epidemiological impact. You know, um, it's hard to justify expensive outreach without that. Um, so you're looking to maximize the potential to rapidly reduce undiagnosed TB. We know we can do it. We did it in Zimbabwe. You know, I think there's many um, um, suggestions of that, um, but we have to um, uh, we have to, to do some demonstration projects, um, uh, work out how to target. Spatial mapping is the obvious thing to use, and um, uh, and we have to invest in um, in understanding and and measuring the impact on underlying TB epidemiology if that is still a deal breaker which it was in that 2013 um, guideline. So I think you know, that is a critical um, investment point. So what um, diagnostics and targets excite me? Well, I feel so bad saying this, but please, can we consider this as our triage test for the moment? Because it works really well, and it is a diagnostic. The digital x-ray and the computer-assisted diagnostics, it's kind of a retrograde step. Um, I, am, uh, I know we're all kind of wanting to move to nano and instrument-free, et cetera, et cetera, but um, you know, this does actually work, and um, it works really well with, with confirmatory TB testing. I'll just um, show you some results, and it is the very next recommended diagnostic. 
um, in the TB care pathway if you are TB test negative. So it's just bringing that, um, you know, it's just kind of reversing. Plus, it's what everyone who does serious screening uses. So, you know, why should TB be an exception? Um, uh, the other is the LAM, which we've heard about, you know, absolutely beautiful um, uh, point of care with high specificity and more sensitive versions in the pipeline. Again, I'll show a little bit of data. And then what I'd really love to see as an epidemiologist, I'll come on to this after this. This is the target I'm interested in. Now, folks, how do we forget this? 35 fewer TB deaths in 2020. You know, that very soon, that is next year. <laughs> We haven't heard a peep about it, but we all agreed and signed up to this, you know? So, you know, I'm interested in the 2020 and the 2025 targets. I really am. Um, and, and I think we just have to race for them before climate change or populist leaders knock us off our perch, you know, which is going to happen. So, you know, I'm really... This is my interest. Um and, um, and I'd love, what I'd love to see um, uh, uh, as well is some new diagnostics to aid the kind of epi side. Um, so, um, you know, something to kind of firm up, are these false positives or not, um, which could be a point of care biomarker. So to go along, you know, if you're going to treat cases, have we got, can we gather a bit more evidence about them to say, yes, they've really got, they're really diseased? The new skin tests for latent TB infection, I think low resource setting skin tests have been tried and trusted, and there are um, the new um, the new CT CTB test, and um, this is what I would really love um, test for recent TB infection, so that we can use it to guide um, the intensity and, and need for intervention. Okay, so you know where are we at scale? This is a primary healthcare clinic in in Malawi. Um, so it's kind of pretty rough and ready, um, uh, but I do think that, that these three can go. So symptom screen, digital x-ray with CAD, computer-assisted diagnostics, and then ex expert. And I do think this can be done at primary care level. I think it's part of health system strengthening. And as I said, if you don't provide x-ray here, then patients die waiting for it, as we showed in the Chipetza study. Um, uh, Urine LAM for screening all hospitalized HIV positive medical patients. So that's actually quite a big market already. There's 100,000 HIV positive admissions in Malawi every year alone. Um, so, you know, that's quite a big global market. And hopefully, Fuji will expand the remit. But at the moment, you know, I, I would be hesitant to move below this because it's a test that works really well for disseminated TB. And we don't yet have the proof that it works well for, for less disseminated TB, and you tend not to find less disseminated TB sitting in the outpatient clinic. You know, you tend to find that in the hospital. And I think that that's really clear from all the autopsy data. Um, uh, and then this, um, so community interventions where there's evidence of affordable impact, the two that we're getting good signals from, digital um, chest x-ray based, and particularly the the um, um, the TB reach um, interventions. Everyone, you know, just I think everyone who's using it is really enthusiastic about it. And uh, and then you know, again, I know it's retrograde, but this approach worked well in Ethiopia, well in Malawi. You, you know, we're really seeing impact um, in terms of of increased diagnoses. Just going back to the X-ray. Um, so let's not say we can't do it. Here we are, Cape Town. <laughs> you know, they maintain this is. Thank you, thank you very much to Sabina for, for giving me this slide. But you know, um, tens of millions of X-rays were done in, in the last century, including in resource poor settings. So um, if we want to, um, we can do it, uh, and you do get a good yield, and, and you do see evidence of of, um, uh, of epidemiological, you know, suggestions of epidemiological impact wherever it's used. Um, I don't know how well this is projecting. Not very well, sorry. But So this is kind of a normal chest X-ray just for the fit clinicians in the room. I'm not going to show you the CAD because it doesn't project well. That is um, um, a big pleural effusion um, affecting that part of the, um, the, the chest. And um, that this is someone with HIV TB, sort of typical kind of scattered patches and um, uh, a cavity in, in the right apex. Um, but slightly unusual looking for HIV negative TB. So it is the next um, step anyway on the smear negative algorithm. So I just point that out. You know, 90% of patients are supposed to have it 
regardless of, you know, if they test negative. So why are we withholding it at the screening stage? And the cabot costs are really falling. It's got the same technolo technology barrier as, as pl flat screen plasma TVs. So, you know, there's something that's really driving that price down that we can benefit from. Um, and once you've got going, there's minimal per test costs. If you add in the computer-assisted diagnosis, um, uh, so that basically does what I've just done. It looks at the lung fills and texture and gives an abnormality score. This is CAD. This is back from 2015 um, um, with seven expert readers. So it's as good as an expert reader, which is pretty good. And, and um, you know, the current... Um, um, uh, the ROC for sort of performance against culture looks pretty similar, actually. Um, and um, the higher you are, you know, the more likely you are to be culture positive. Um, I, there's sort of publications coming out, um, uh, and I, I think this is a field that's going to grow um, hugely. But um, um, if we could please um, embrace that in the diagnostic fold, because at the moment I don't think it's got a home. And, you know, it's like the old days when you have to rely on, you know, which you know, culture system to buy um, based on what the reps are telling you rather than based, in, based on what Fine's telling you. Um, so, you know, I, I really think it's important that, that we embrace this. That's um, problematic. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, lipo um, okay, lamb. Okay, so just to mention... Um, um, uh, uh, we have a guideline, well, hopefully there's going to be a guideline in um, review in 2019 um, uh, that will move this, um, the guideline, the recommendations forward. Um, just to mention Steve Lorne, who, my colleague who um, um, died of a brain tumour in, in the middle of a stamp trial that was very much his baby. Um, uh, two things that he said that definitely occurred. First of all, that a lot of the benefit is from um, being a, people being able to produce a specimen, whereas sputum is difficult, as we, as we know, and also that you're going to get a big extra yield from the lamb. So if you like, this is the group, but I would like to have a, a kind of some, non some straightforward biomarker that we can say, yes, we think this probably is TB, um, but um, uh, at the moment... And we do, you know, what we powered it around was mortality because it's unequivocal. You know, you, you want fewer deaths um, rather than diagnostic yield. Um, so, uh, if you can just, skip, but you know, I think I think we're there. You know, I think we've got like good engage or not. We're nearly there. We've got good engagement on the on the advocacy, and I, and I think we're going to see um, um, the scaling up at country level pretty quickly, m driven really by the HIV program. Um, um, mainly. Um, this is the data from STAMP, so, and I just want to point out, um, um, so we, we, did, we did power for mortality, because as I said, it's kind of unequivocal. You definitely always want less. Um, and uh, um, we had three predefined high-risk groups. Each one looked pretty similar, where um, you're seeing you know, quite a substantial reduction in mortality from a TB screen, and this includes people without any TB symptoms who may not have TB at all, so this is just all admissions to to um, hospital with HIV. Well, who, you know, HIV diagnosed on admission or, or known beforehand. And I, I think this is the other of Steve's hypothesis that people were being discharged un undiagnosed. And I think these data support that very um, strongly, um, where you're seeing this diverging lines in in survival um, um, uh, later on um, when most patients have been discharged. So that's pretty awful, isn't it? You go into hospital and you're discharged with undiagnosed TB. Um, for TB diagnosis, that was increased one and a half fold. Um, uh, but as, a, uh, as I sort of alluded to on the previous slide, this includes isolated lamb positives. Um, uh, okay, so what about community-wide active case finding? I think I'm gonna. This, is, this should be quick now. Um, so I, I think there's, you know, I, I think we've we've got three indications that I'd like people to consider. So the first one is where people, where the government has a special duty of care. So this includes health workers, um, minors, prisoners, and the military, um, you know, groups like this. Some people would put school kids in too, um, where undiagnosed active TB is extremely high. So you know, two to four percent. 
Um, so there you've got a number needed to screen of about um, um, you know, 25, basically, you know, a really low number. Would you want to live in that community? If you were asked to vote, would you like to have a screening programme introduced? You know, I would be begging for it. You know, um, uh, we see a major cause of death, horrifically high TB, um, childhood TB incidence, and extremely dangerous to people living with um, HIV. So I don't know why we're not doing more about this. Um, and, um, uh, and then you've got the sort of most of the world, which is um, um, this kind of um, below the 1% level. Um, so, you know, for these, I think, again, you know, I think we should be doing really aggressive interventions now, um, uh, aiming to, to um, at least, you know, bring that curve, bring the epidemic curve down um, while um, um, social determinants, structural interventions, etc., cetera, um, come into place. Um, uh, and um, very much, you know, working in the facilities at the same time as, as any um, um, community outreach. But we know that the community outreach works, and, and we would be, um, we would need to have a system to stop or reduce frequency um, when the yield falls. Um, this is, is less clear, but I think we also essential if we're going to meet those goals by 2020 and by 2025 even. Um, uh, and, and here, you know, I'll just whiz through this. I think it is more difficult. You know, we do have to say this, you know, first do no harm. It's easy to do harm. Um, needs very careful planning, um, but the, a lot of promise. And there's lots of these now. You can double case notification rates. So this is just us from, from Zimbabwe, that same intervention that we used, uh, uh, sorry, in Malawi, the same intervention we used in Zimbabwe, doubling smear positive case um, detection. Um, partly, well, partly by pickup in the field, but mainly by um, uh, a sort of behaviour change effect, um, leading to to um, um, uh, better health-seeking behaviour. Um, uh, so, what we call indirect effect, and you know we've got evidence for that. Um, but you know these are everywhere. You see these. You know this is TB reach, and the Khan, the Ethiopian model, etc. Um, so, and, and I think we just need to, to, to sort of think through and ask these questions. Um, really avoid high test costs if the number needed to screen is high. So that's what the problem with expert. Uh, and again, you really need these high throughput systems. Um, so what, um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, that's my conclusion. So, so, um, uh, so what do I think? Okay, we're at the stage of being able to support rapid scale up. I do think that's true. Um, I think we need to do it. Um, uh, um, I would be hoping we'd see, um, uh, you know, a WHO review guideline review triggered fairly soon. Um, so, does the evidence now support more aggressive strategies than it did five years ago? Certainly seems that way for me. Um, while we wait for the perfect point of care diagnostic, I would like to see us, you know, really getting behind these interventions that we know. Um, do work um, and scaling them up, um, you know, especially in the high HIV settings where there are vulnerable people um, living alongside, um, and um, uh, and to evaluate new diagnostic um, needs in the context of that scale up. Um, in terms of evidence gap, you know, I think this is still the big one. Can we re reduce um, um, the TB epidemic by case finding? Um, and I'd just um, like to acknowledge my um, main collaborators and also my funders, um, mainly the Wellcome Trust. Um, and um, I'll leave on that slide. Which I don't know, should we leave it up for discussion? Or yeah. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Liz. I think your passion for this topic was obvious. <laughs>